On this, the December 20th, 2023 edition of What's Going On with Shipping, we're going to discuss Operation Prosperity Guardian and whether to convoy or to not convoy. I'm your host, Sal Mercogliano. Welcome to today's episode. So we've been following the situation going on in and around the Red Sea, the Bab el-Mandab, and the Gulf of Aden, all perpetrated by the Houthi in Yemen in response to the conflict going on between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. And this has become an issue regarding global supply chains. Many of the world's largest shipping companies, BP, Maersk, Hophog, C, uh, CMA, CGM, have all announced the decision to bypass going through the Bab el-Mandab and the Suez Canal and instead take the longer route around Africa. That's having an impact on the global supply chain. We're going to discuss that. We're going to talk about what is going on regarding this naval operation and what role does U.S. and foreign shipping companies play in the execution of this. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So this is a story over in G Captain by Admiral James Stravitas. Operation Prosperity Guardian, can the U.S.-led naval force end Houthi ship attacks? So James Stravitas, uh, well known for his role as commander of Southern Command and later on as NATO, he really lays out several issues here. Number one, he talks about the conflict building around the Red Sea. We've documented that with a number of attacks that we've seen in and around the area. He talks about understanding the surge in attacks, what these style of attacks mean, and what we're seeing. We just saw two more attacks yesterday, so we're definitely seeing that. He talks about intelligence and being able to gather intelligence and what type of assets you'll need in and around the area. And again, he really highlights the fact that you're going to need a lot more than just ships in and around this area to do this. He goes on with the need for more allies. I was really shocked by the numbers of ships that were, or excuse me, the number of nations that were identified in Operation Prosperity Guardian. It's a lot less than what's usually in CTF-153, Combined Task Force 153. It's overwhelmingly US, Canada, European. The only outside countries are Bahrain and the Seychelles. And I don't think Bahrain and the Seychelles are sending anything big over to do patrolling in and around the Bab el-Mandab. Plus, I am hearing now that there are rumors that some of the allies are not crazy with the operation and may decide to pull out. And then the last thing he talks about here, and the one I want to talk about, is shipping companies must engage with the U.S. Navy. Uh, based on what we're seeing, he's calling upon the largest shipping companies, Maersk, MSC, BP, uh, all th to work with the U.S. Navy through either the International Maritime Organization, which is the U.N. branch of ocean shipping, or some other organization to assist. And I think that is key. What is going to be the problem in executing this operation is the shipping companies. And let me explain that to you. This is the region in question. This is from Marine Traffic. Red dots represent tankers. Green dots are freighters. And you'll see there is traffic still moving through the Bab el-Mandab. Typically 17,000 ships a year go through this region, so about 50 to 70 a day. That number is down. But what you will notice here, if we zoom in here just a little bit, you'll notice a large confluence of ships right here between Port Sudan and Jeddah sitting here. These are ships waiting to come out, waiting for some sort of clearance so that it can exit the Red Sea through the Bab el-Mandab. We're seeing the same thing actually down at the other end of the Suez Canal, down at the Gulf of Aden. If we clean up that image and just have U.S. flagships, you'll notice something. In the Red Sea are two ships, the Maersk Kensington of Maersk Lines and the Ark Liberty. This is of American roll-on, roll-off carriers. And then out in the Gulf of Oman, three Maersk ships, the Maersk Chicago, the Maersk Selatar, and the Maersk Durban. And just north of the Suez, waiting to make the passage south, is the Maersk Sentosa and then the Waterman steamship car carrier Green Bay. Now, three different companies, six ships, seven if you count, Maersk and Tosa waiting to go through with more ships getting ready to come out of the Persian Gulf and head this way. These are U.S. flag ships. And what I can't help but notice is they're not moving through the Bab el-Mandeb. We know there are U.S. Navy destroyers on location in and around this area to provide escorts, but they're not moving. 
And this has to do with an issue about the ownership of these vessels. The Maersk vessels are operated in the United States by an outfit called Maersk Lines Limited. Maersk Lines Limited is a subsidiary of Maersk. Maersk in turn is owned by AP Moeller. That is a Danish company. Liberty, which is under American roll-on, roll-off carriers, is a subsidiary of Willenius Wilhelm. This is a Norwegian-Swedish company. Green Bay is really the only true U.S. flag vessel or U.S.-owned vessel. It's owned by Waterman Steamship uh, under Seacor. So these vessels, even though they can get U.S. Navy escorts to go through the area, are not moving yet. And understand, these vessels, all of them, you'll see they're marked in yellow, that's part of the maritime security program. These ships receive a subsidy from the U.S. government to be U.S. flagged, plus almost all of them are carrying Department of Defense cargo on board. So not only have the Houthis stopped the major flow of the largest ocean carriers in the world, but they've actually stopped ships of the U.S. flag and ships that are carrying Department of Defense cargo from going through here. So how is it that convoys will solve this? So we're talking about convoying, and let me get out of your head first off. This is not going to be Tom Hanks and Greyhound leading 50-something ships through the Bob El Mandeb. That's probably not what we're going to see, largely because we don't have the ships to do that, and also because a lot of ships going through that region will not want to be escorted. So, for example, ships of the Dark Fleet, those ships that are hauling Russian oil, are going through that region right now and amazingly not being attacked. Ships carrying Iranian oil, again, amazingly, are not being attacked going through the Bab el-Mandab. It just seems to be ships affiliated not just with Israel, but ships that are trading with the West. Those seem to be the ones that are targeted. So probably the best example we have of this happening goes back to the late 1980s, Operation Earnest Will. This was the convoying of tankers out of the Persian Gulf through the Straits of Hormuz. Back in the 1980s, Iran and Iraq were engaged in a war, and they subsequently attacked shipping in the Persian Gulf. Over 450 ships were hit. But it wasn't until late in the war, 1987, that Kuwait decided to reflag their tankers to the U.S. registry. But understand, this was a handful of tankers. We're only talking about two dozen ships. So that the escorts weren't involved huge amount of ships daily. You can basically pulse a few ships a day in and out of the region. You weren't sailing massive convoys out of the time. Plus, these ships had re-registered to the U.S. registry. Many of the ships right now that are waiting, waiting in the Red Sea, in the Gulf of Aden, or have been diverted by the big ocean carriers are not flying U.S. flag. You saw the handful of U.S. flag ships out there, seven of them. The majority of those ships fly the flags of Liberia, Panama, the Marshall Islands, and other open registries. They're registered in those countries because they pay very little money to operate under those registries. And one of the things they don't pay for are navies and defense. So that is a big issue about whether or not the U.S. and its allies should get involved in transport or should get involved in escorting ships of open registries. Now, granted, they're carrying cargo for the world, and that's the argument in their favor. Back in the 1990s, we had Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, a massive influx of ships that sailed into this region. And convoying wasn't provided during this time period. Instead, what you had was a series of waypoints and checkpoints set up so that when you entered into the Persian Gulf, you'd go to Point Alpha, then Bravo, then Charlie, then Delta, and Echo is the furthest up. And you would check in. There would be uh, allied naval vessels on in position so that if you encountered any problems, you can get assistance. And you had to check in at each of the checkpoints as you went along through the Persian Gulf. Some ships that were part of the Sealift effort that sailed from the United States had some of the equipment loaded on the top decks with anti-aircraft equipment and missile defense so that the riding crews from the units on board could potentially fight the ships from their embarked uh, units on board. Uh, it was a pretty haphazard way of doing it. In 2003, after the attacks on September 11th and when the United States decides to invade Iraq along with some allies in Operation Iraqi Freedom, and there was a big fear of terrorist attacks on these ships, the United States initiated Operation Guardian Mariner. 
Uh, the National Guard, the 92nd Infantry Brigade of the U.S. National Guard based in Puerto Rico was activated. And that brigade was broken up into 13-person detachments. And those units were put on board vessels to ride as onboard security elements, very akin to the Naval Armed Guard detachments during World War I and World War II. Now, during the period of Somali piracy in the early 2000s, when the Somalis were seizing vessels, capturing the ships, sailing them in the Somali waters, and then holding them hostage. Initially, there was no response by the world to this. There really wasn't. Nobody really cared about this because the ships getting grabbed in Somali were off the east coast of Africa. They really weren't on the main trade route. And so what was happening was the companies were basically just paying for the uh, uh, ransoms. However, as the Somali piracy became more rampant and they, they ventured further and further out using motherships, private companies decided to use armed guard detachments, private security. And understand, the reason merchant ships are not armed at all is because you can't sail into many ports around the world with a lot of weapons on board. They just are not going to let you in. Are you going to allow a ship into your port with a foreign crew and a lot of weapons loose? Probably not. And so what happened was uh, several companies created these armed guard units. And what a ship would do is it would meet out in the ocean a vessel, uh, kind of like a crew boat or an offshore supply vessel. The armed guards would come on board with their weapons. They would sail with the vessel through the contested area. Then on the other side, meet another supply boat, get off with their weapons and their crew, and then they would get themselves loaded onto another ship heading the other way. And they would sign on for a set period of time. They'd operate in that way, and periodically that boat would have to come in or offshore and change out crew and personnel. So you created this kind of armed guard detachment. Now, as the level of piracy increased, and more importantly, as ships of larger nations got attacked, for example, Maersk, Alabama, which was a U.S. flag vessel, when that was seized and captured, unlike other ships that were seized and captured and sailed into Somali waters, this time the U.S. Navy reacted and reacted big. I, I mean, you got an aircraft, you got a helicopter carrier, you got a guided missile destroyer, the Bainbridge, you got a frigate, you got Navy SEALs, you got Tom Hanks. I, I mean, this was a big event. But most pirates were not treated this way. They did not get this kind of attention. If you were on a Panamanian, a Liberian, a Marshall Island flag vessel, well, you're out of luck, Chuck, because you're going to get captured and you're going to be sailing into Somali waters and you're going to have to wait to be freed because no one was coming to get you. Then you see the creation in 2022 of Combined Task Force 153. Now, I'm having a bit of a problem with, with some discussions right now because this entity stood up in 2022. It's been commanded by U.S. naval officers and Egyptian naval officers. The past, the current commander and the past commander were U.S. naval officers. The commander of Destroyer Squadron 50 based in Bahrain with the U.S. Fifth Fleet. They're given the mission of patrolling and, and operating in and around the Red Sea, the Bab el-Mandab, and the Gulf of Aden. The problem is, this is a staff commanded by a Navy 06, a captain, pretty low order in terms of seniority of rank, probably minimal staff. So a, not a lot of work was probably done to prepare for an operation of this scope and scale, which is a problem because everybody saw this coming. There's no reason this should have surprised everybody. Everybody should have been well aware that the Houthi and the potential existed here for trade to be interdicted. Yet we find ourselves kind of, you know, at a loss. And a lot of people are telling me, well, the reason those American ships are still holding in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden is because they're still working out the details. Okay, but you have American ships. We know the Carnies down there. We know the Masons down there. We know there are other ships in and around the area. Laboon just came through the Suez Canal. Thomas Hudner's there. There's no reason an American destroyer can't grab those ships in the Red Sea, bring them down, capture, you know, grab the four in the Gulf of uh, Aden and bring them through unless the ocean carriers don't want to come through. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So CTF-153 has been up and running for a year. But again, the combined maritime forces there have a lot of jobs to do, obviously. But this is a primary one, I would argue. The idea of escorting... Now, understand, the U.S. Navy practices for a long time. 
They have something called NCAGS, Navy Control of Shipping. Uh, they have reserve officers, uh, strategic sea lift officers who are merchant mariners who are commissioned in the U.S. Navy. So there is expertise in the Navy. But when I tell you that this is at the bottom of priority in the U.S. Navy, I can't uh, imagine a ship go down to the bilge, which is the very bottom of the ship, and then drill a hole in the bottom of the ship and go down to the bottom of the ocean. That's the priority that Navy control of shipping and strategic sea lift officers have within the confines of the U.S. Navy that talks about SEALs, aviators, submariners, and surface warfare officers. That's what I'm talking about. This is a big problem in terms of readiness for this. And so we're finding ourselves without the proper planning of how to convoy through this area. And that kind of brings me to the last point here. This is the point that Admiral Stravitas brought up here, which is the issue of working with the shipping company. All right, how do you do this? I, I mean, seriously, how do you do this? Are we going to do this a la Tom Hanks in Greyhound? Are we going to do this a la the Operation Earnest Will, the convoying out of the Persian Gulf? Are we going to set up kind of patrols that were set up after Tom Hanks was grabbed in Maersk, Alabama. Boy, Tom Hanks seems to be the center of this whole conversation. Uh, are we going to uh, set up p patrols like we did against piracy? But again, piracy was dealing with, you know, a couple of Somalis with AK-47s and RPGs in a boat. The Houthi have drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles. How are we going to do this? Are you going to set up these big Convoys, because not everyone's going to wait for convoys. Convoying means you've got to stop vessels. You've got to huddle them together. You have to have enough vessels to screen them. More than likely, what you're talking about is setting up pickets, setting up patrol lines where the ships will patrol between the main shipping channel and Yemen. The problem with that is you're going to expand a lot of ordnance. You're going to need a lot of replenishment. You're going to need a lot of ships to do this. And right now, the number of nations who have signed up with this, and again, I'm not even sure we have those nations with us. Unless you're providing a lot of weaponry and a lot of ordnance, that's going to be a problem. If you're using Arleigh Burke class destroyers, which are premier, these are the ones you want to use. There's only four to six maybe available right now. You're going to have to replenish them down at Djibouti, which is a very forward base to be using. Uh, you're seeing, again, different styles of attack. You have maybe Houthi privateers operating out of Somalia, seizing ships. And what prevents Iran from getting into this and start throwing missiles across the Straits of Hormuz at Israeli vessels? This is a big problem. And the biggest one right now is even if you set up convoys or this picket, you got to convince the shipping companies to come back to this. And I'm not 100% sure you convince the shipping companies to come back to here because right now the shipping companies are seeing the potential for profit. They have an opportunity to sail their ships over these long distances, get higher freight rates, use vessels in the container market that they have in excess of. In the tanker market, there's not enough tankers. This is going to raise up the value of the tankers. In the meantime, Russia is able to sail its vessels right through the Bab el-Mandab, which gives them a leg up for getting oil and fuel between countries in and around the world. There is a geopolitical, economic merchant marine aspect here that we're not looking at. Again, the Navy won the fight against Houthi missiles, but they've lost the war in the economic aspect because the ocean companies didn't sit there and say, listen, unless you fix this problem, we're going to sail around Africa. They sat there and said, we're sailing around Africa, fix the problem. And unless we get a clear iteration from the shipping companies what this is, I'm not exactly sure that even if you set this up, that they come back to sailing through this area. Understand, Maersk Lines, again, back in Copenhagen, this is AP Moeller, has basically said, unless you escort all our vessels, that's Maersk container ships flying the flags of Panama, Liberia, Marshall Islands, whatever flags they fly, and Maersk tankers, then we're not going to be moving the Maersk ships that get $5 million per year from the U.S. government and are being paid to carry part of their cargo is Department of Defense cargo, they're not going to move them. And to me, that is a huge problem that I don't think everybody understands yet. Because if companies are sitting there saying that they're not going to take a U.S. escort to go through, then what happens when we have to fight a war against, I don't know, Iran or Russia or, heaven forbid, China across the Pacific? 
What does this mean if you're on the Indio PACOM staff or the Central Command staff or the Europe staff and or the Africa Com staff? And you got to come up with a plan where you can get defeated by several cruise missiles, guided missiles, drones and ballistic missiles interdicting your supply line. Because understand, those naval vessels need supply to be able to run. They need fuel. They need weapons. They need ammunition. They need toilet paper. They need food. They need everything. And if they're not getting them, they're not going to work. Same thing with soldiers on the ground. Air Force needs fuel and bombs for their aircraft. This is a multi-dimensional problem we're facing. And the issue here isn't just to convoy or not to convoy. There has got to be meetings, and I know there's meetings going on in Washington, D.C. right now between the military and U.S. flag companies, but there needs to be meetings with Maersk from Denmark, CMA CGM, Mediterranean Shipping, BP, Euronav, all these companies that have announced that they're not sailing through the Bob De- El Mandab, there has to be a discussion to f- come up with this. And this cannot be the United States alone doing it. While the U.S. may sh- shoulder a large part of the burden, where are the rest of the Europeans? Where are the Germans in this? Where are South Korea? Where is Japan? Where is everybody else who benefits from trade through this area who's going to be affected by it? Because this is a global issue. The Houthi in shooting these missiles and getting the ocean carriers to turn around did something that the Germans couldn't do across the Atlantic in World War I or World War II. And it required nearly five years for the United States to do in the Pacific at great cost to themselves. The Houthi, without losing anything but shooting some missiles into the air, have interdicted one of the main supply lines across the entire planet and have forced the major ocean carriers to divert their traffic, thereby causing global inflation, global freight rates to go up, and at the same time forcing the navies of the world to come up with a counter that's completely defensive to the Houthi attacks. Because I don't think anybody is going to really want to attack Houthi targets on land, even though we just moved the Eisenhower battle group out of the Persian Gulf into the Gulf Gulf of Aden, I'm not sure a lot of people are going to have a lot of stomach to do that, let alone if that doesn't work, putting Marines on the beach off the Bataan amphibious ready group that's sitting in the Red Sea. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll learn about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon. You'll see the link in the show notes down below or at the very end of the video and you become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Until our next video or the next thing happens in the per- in the, uh, Gulf of, <laughs> the, the Gulf of Aden, the Bob El-Mandab and the Red Sea, this is Sal signing off.